um, welcome everyone to another SciTech Asia virtual seminar. I will hand over the floor to my colleague Loretta Lowe, who is going to introduce the host, the, the speaker for today's event. Thank you, Loretta. Thank you, Gonzalo. So it's my great pleasure today to introduce to you Professor Marshall Inhont from uh, Yale University. So Professor Inhont is uh, with the William K. Lincoln Jr. Professor of Anthropology and International Affairs at Yale University. She is a medical anthropologist specialized in gender and reproductive health. And she's the author of six books on infertility and assisted reproductive technologies. And I believe that her talk today is about the book that she's she's completing or like her latest book, the seventh book um, is called The Mating Gap to Why American Women Are Freezing Their Eggs. It's a topic that I am super interested in and I'm sure all the audience are too. So without further ado, I'll pass the floor to you, Marcia. Well, thank you, Loretta and Gonzalo and everybody who is here today in the audience. I'm really pleased to be talking about egg freezing on what is a very beautiful fall day in New Haven, Connecticut. And so I guess my main question today is, is egg freezing going to be a reproductive revolution? I want to talk about gender issues, the technology itself, and then something, uh, a theme that I'm developing called reproductive weighthood. And let's see, just to make it move forward. Uh, we need to begin at the beginning, just to remind us where assisted reproductive technologies began in England uh, uh, at the University of Cambridge. Uh, and in 1978, the world's first uh, test tube baby was born. These are her parents, John and Leslie Brown. And today, baby Louise is now 43 years old. Uh, she's a kind of a star of IVF. She wrote a memoir about being the world's first test tube baby. And in, in the 40th anniversary year, she sort of traveled around the world on a book tour. She's been a big advocate for um, ARTs, IVF as a solution as a solution to infertility for couples like her parents. And so IVF was the start, the start of what we call assisted reproductive technologies. Our colleague at University of Cambridge, Sarah Franklin has written many books, but the two that I just wanna mention are her first book called Embodied Progress, A Cultural Account of Assisted Conception, where she was the one who argued that IVF should be considered a hope technology. It's a technology giving hope amidst difficulty and struggle to the millions of infertile people around the world. And then later in 2013, she published another book called Biological Relatives, where she argued that IVF has been a kind of scientific platform technology for many different assisted reproductive technologies that have followed. And just to give you some sense of that, um, these are, I would say, some of the most important second generation ARTs or assisted reproductive technologies one that I've spent a lot of time thinking about and writing about, um, and I wrote a book about it, is intracytoplasmic sperm injection, or ICSI, which is a variant of IVF. It was developed in Belgium in the early 1990s, and it is really a specialized reproductive technology to overcome male infertility. Um, you all probably know about so-called third-party reproductive assistance, where uh, women and couples can use donor egg, donor sperm, even donor embryos to help them when their gametes are not functioning well. And then of course there's gestational surrogacy where another woman will carry the pregnancy of a commissioning couple, either because the woman's got difficulties in her own uterus and increasingly because gay male couples are um, using gestational surrogacy really around the world um, in order to have their own biogenetically related offspring. And then there are these variants uh, that are really about testing IVF embryos. The first one is pre-implantation genetic diagnosis or PGD uh, to really screen for genetic defects in embryos before they're put back into a woman's uterus in IVF. Pre-implantation genetic screening, PGS is increasingly being done on all embryos, IVF embryos, uh, to sort of assess their quality. And sort of seriously, in some parts of the world, PGS is being used to sex the embryos in IVF, and the potential there is that sex selection can arise from this particular technology. And just 
to be really clear, the stem cell industry uh, really emerged from IVF. Human embryonic stem cell research began um, in the leftover IVF embryos in labs around the world. And obviously today, stem cell research is being uh, developed for a variety of therapeutic interventions. And then potentially uh, IVF could at some point in the future lead to human reproductive cloning where individuals would really make uh, identical versions of themselves, um, uh, mini me's as it were. There is a worldwide ethical ban on human reproductive cloning, but I will say that cloning has been successfully used in other mammals. Um, and the famous example is Dolly the sheep, a whole book written about that by our colleague, Sarah Franklin at Cambridge. But today I wanna to talk about cryopreservation, the freezing and preserving of gametes and embryos in IVF laboratories around the world. And I specifically wanna talk about oocyte cryopreservation. The oocyte is the scientific term for the egg. Uh, so egg freezing, if you will. And egg freezing, I, sh I, will, I shall say in the early decades of IVF, egg freezing was impossible. Sperm freezing had been mastered. Embryo freezing was mastered early on in IVF in the 1980s. The problem with eggs is that they are the largest cell in the human body and they're filled with water, they're watery. And they found that when they tried to freeze eggs, it did not work well. There, the, it, there was crystallization, fragmentation. The eggs, if they could be frozen, often didn't survive the thaw. And then in the early 2000s, actually, this began really successfully in the country of Japan. Um, the, there was a new technology developed for egg freezing called vitrification, a form of flash freezing or fast freezing um, human eggs that proved much more successful. So you could actually flash freeze them, fast freeze the eggs, keep them in storage for as long as you wanted. And then when the eggs were rewarmed or thawed, the survival rates were much, much higher. And so if done well, this form of egg freezing has a so-called 90% efficiency rate. If you freeze 100 human eggs, 90% of them, 90 of them should survive the thaw. So that's the goal. So vitrification was a game changer in, in the world of egg freezing. And so what happened? Egg freezing, I'm just gonna call it EF for short. It was finally approved for clinical use in America in late 2012 and in Europe, I should say, both the American Society for Reproductive Medicine and ESHRI, which is the European Society for Human Reproduction and Embryology, they both put out statements allowing egg freezing through vitrification to be moved into clinical use. They weren't exactly enthusiastic about it, but they said it could be could be permitted in IVF laboratories. And so we're talking here about egg freezing, not for medical conditions. I mean, not for women who have cancer or other kinds of serious reproductive health problems. This is egg freezing for healthy women who had the desire to freeze their eggs. And within one year, 5,000 egg freezing cycles were already performed in the US. Uh, five years on in 2018, it was estimated that 12,000 egg freezing cycles had been performed in the US. And just to say that egg freezing is half of an IVF cycle. It's basically performing the first half of the egg freezing cycle, but then putting those eggs retrieved into deep freeze, into storage for later use, for the other half of the IVF cycle later on. And what it really allows is that during that period of time when eggs are in storage, they're frozen in time. So if a woman is 30 years old when she freezes her eggs and she comes back 10 years later at age 40 to use those eggs, she will be using her much younger, presumably healthier 30 year old eggs. And in human reproduction, many people would argue that it's really egg age, not womb age that matters the most. Really your fertility as a woman is more dependent on the quality and the age of your eggs than on the quality and age of your uterus. Um, and we can talk about that later on if you're interested. The problem with all of this is that egg freezing is expensive. Actually, it's as expensive and sometimes more expensive than an IVF cycle. And in the US, unfortunately, is the most expensive place in the world to 
uh, perform either egg freezing or IVF, you know, the average cost of an IVF cycle is usually well over 10,000, more like $15,000 in many cases with the medications. Um, it's usually not covered by health insurance. We don't have a national health care system in the United States. And so people are sort of forced to pay for IVF and egg freezing out of pocket, and it's costly. And so that's sort of the problem facing women who hope to use this technology. So there's been a lot written about egg freezing, including some major scholarly reviews about this new technology. And so what do the scholarly reviews argue? Um, they argue that egg freezing is being used by women to postpone, defer, or delay their fertility, their childbearing. And those are often the verbs that are used, postpone, defer, or delay. And usually four major reasons are cited. Um, the first one being education and career. There's a widespread assumption in the literature that women are turning to egg freezing as a postponement strategy so that they can pursue their education, develop their careers, and wait to have children. So that is the most oft-cited reason why uh, egg freezing supposedly is being done in the world. Um, some authors do argue, well, actually, egg freezing prevents so-called age-related fertility de decline. Um, women often don't really understand this, but at age 32 or thereabouts, um, women's fertility starts to decline. And by age 37, five years later, it really declines. It's, we, it's called the so-called fertility cliff that happens in the late 30s. And so scholars say, well, if women freeze their eggs in their, let's say, early 30s, they're really preventing their own infertility problems later on. So that's an important, uh, important use for this technology. There's a sort of liberal feminist reading of egg freezing that argues that egg freezing is a way for women to maintain their reproductive autonomy. It's a technology of choice. Women can use it, choose to use it just like they choose contraception, abortion, and it allows women to really make independent reproductive decisions about their reproductive bodies. And potentially they could even be reproductively autonomous from men if they choose to freeze their eggs and later on use donor sperm to make a baby without having a male partner involved. And then some reviews do mention, well, maybe egg freezing is being done because women lack an appropriate partner. So that's sometimes mentioned, but I will emphasize the major reason in the scholarly literature is that women are doing this to pursue their educations and careers. But a Belgian bioethicist named Heidi Mertes published a really early, I think very prescient article in 2013, looking at the three most common media portrayals of egg freezing. And even back then in the first year that egg freezing became available in Europe and the US, she said, we already see these sort of three media discourses being pushed. The first one she called the discourse of the selfish career pursuing woman. The idea that women are being selfish because they're pursuing their careers and in order to do that, they're postpone, postponing their fertility through egg freezing. So that really sort of blames women for being career minded. The second uh, discourse in, in, involves the sort of blaming of society that women who use egg freezing are really victims of a male oriented society, which makes the motherhood work balance very difficult. And so this discourse is really saying uh, the problem is work life, work culture, women have to make tough decisions, they can't become mothers while working, and therefore they have to use egg freezing. And there's been a lot of this, especially when the big tech firms in California back in about 2014, 2015 decided to offer egg freezing as a company benefit. And then there's a sort of liberal feminist reading of egg freezing that argues, well, no, actually women who freeze their eggs are wise, proactive women who won't have to rely on donor oocytes or donor eggs later on when they're facing age-related related fertility decline. So this is a kind of pro-woman liberal feminist reading that women are being very wise to use this technology. So Heidi Mertes, um, who's written a lot about egg freezing, said, well, this is what we see in the media, but are any of these portrayals of egg freezing women really accurate, she asked. She said, maybe this is really not why women are turning to egg freezing. 
And so I want to further that idea and put forward a sort of thesis that I'm calling reproductive weighthood. Weighthood is actually a term that was proposed by my Middle Eastern, Middle Eastern studies colleague, Diane Singerman, saying that if we look around the world, we see that a lot of young adults are waiting to marry and have children in a kind of prolonged state of adolescence. Um, and really deferring the sort of path into adulthood. And she argued because she was working in the country of Egypt that a lot of this was really unintended. Weighthood was unintended because people were fit, young people were facing dire economic and political problems that were really forcing them into this sort of delayed adulthood, which she called weighthood. And I've liked the weighthood concept. I think it's very productive. And so I am saying, well, what about reproductive weighthood? Why are so many people around the world waiting longer and longer to partner and to have children? I'm calling this reproductive weighthood. And so there might be a couple of reasons for this. And so one thesis would argue, well, actually maybe women are using egg freezing as a productive weighthood strategy on their paths to professional fulfillment. They're doing it intentionally. They're doing egg freezing so they can plan their futures. And if this is true, then it really agrees with the kind of liberal feminist reading that argues that egg freezing is a useful technology um, for women who are planning their career, a career planning strategy. It would allow these women to decouple motherhood from the constraints of their own reproductive biology, from the ticking of the so-called biological clock. It would allow women to achieve a kind of reproductive autonomy for men. They don't have to rush into marriage and partnership just because they're worried about motherhood. And if this is true, then egg freezing really would be a reproductive revolution, a new technology that allows women to have it all, much like the birth control pill and its introduction in the 1960s was really revolutionary for women in terms of planning their own families and their reproduction. So that's one possibility, but there is an alternative thesis about reproductive weighthood that also may be true. Maybe women are sort of being forced to use egg freezing because they're forced into weighthood, reproductive weighthood without reproductive partners. And if this is the case, if they're having trouble finding reproductive partners, then egg freezing isn't really so revolutionary. Rather, it would be kind of a technological concession to circumstances beyond women's individual control. Egg freezing then would be kind of a stopgap measure to sort of stop the clock while women are still searching for stable reproductive relationships. And if this is true, then all of the sort of liberal feminist readings of egg freezing, that it's a revolution, it's for women to achieve reproductive control and autonomy, well, then those readings would be misguided. And I'm going to tell you that before I ever really started studying egg freezing ethnographically, I really had no idea which of these theses was going to be correct. I mean, they were hypothetical, but until I talked with women who had frozen their eggs, I really didn't know what I was going to find. I didn't know which discourse, which reading was going to turn out to be true. And so I undertook a large study funded by the US National Science Foundation and both the cultural anthropology and science and society programs. I conducted it over two very intensive years um, in 2014, 2016, sort of in the height of the first decade of egg freezing in America. I recruited women from four IVF clinic sites, um, mostly on the East Coast, but also on the West Coast. And actually women joined my study, volunteered for my study from a number of other um, IVF clinics in different cities. And so I actually really had a, quite a spectrum of women from across America. And I was able to do very in-depth ethnographic interviews with women in which I collected what I would really call their egg freezing stories. Um, I asked a few simple demographic questions, but then I would ask women, well, tell me your egg freezing story. And a lot of information tumbled out. And the only criterion um, was that women um, had to have undertaken at least one egg freezing cycle. They had to have already done it, not be thinking about it or planning it. These were women who had actually undertaken at least one egg freezing cycle and sometimes more. 
And so who were these women? I'm only talking about so-called elective egg freezers, sometimes called social egg freezers, but women didn't like the term social egg freezing. They thought it made it sound like a party, which it is not. And so <laughs> I have really um, used the term that women preferred, which was elective egg freezing. I also interviewed women who were medical egg freezers, women who were undertaking egg freezing usually because they had cancer diagnoses. And so I'm not talking about them today. I'm talking about the 114 women who froze their eggs electively. And it's a very important finding at the time of egg freezing, elective egg freezing, these women were already nearly 37 years old. They were at their fertility cliff. If the fertility cliff is defined as being at age 37, where there's a, quite a distinctive decline in women's ovarian reserve, these women were tipping on the border of that cliff. And so they were using egg freezing in their late 30s. Um, in terms of ethnicity, about two thirds of the women in my study were white. But there were many minority women, about a third of the women in my study were Asian American, Black, Latinx, mixed race, or Middle Eastern, sort of defying a kind of argument that only white women use egg freezing in America. That is not true. And I really want to note, because many of you are in Asia, the largest single minority population using egg freezing in my study were Asian American women of a variety of different Asian American heritage backgrounds. These were urban secular women. Um, most of them were living in big cities, um, especially along the so-called East Coast Corridor, which runs from Boston all the way down to Washington, DC. But I also interviewed women in California, particularly in the Silicon Valley Bay Area. And then about a quarter of women came from other major US cities, such as Chicago, Los Angeles, um, Seattle. Atlanta, and so women really from all over the country, but mostly these were professional women living in large cities. And I asked about religious affiliation and the majority I would say of women had been raised in some religious tradition, particularly Catholicism. There were many American Catholic women, but most women identified themselves as non-practicing. They were secular. There's a growing category in America called SBNR, spiritual but not religious. So women say, well, I'm spiritual, but I don't identify with any religious group. Some women just said, I'm an atheist, I'm agnostic. And then some women did identify as still practicing Protestant religions, Catholicism, or Orthodox religions. And then there were quite a few Jewish women as well as Muslims and Hindus in my study. The most important thing, these were highly educated women, um, really highly educated women. Only 20% of women had stopped at the bachelor's degree. They got their bachelor's degrees and then they stopped. The rest went on for so-called postgraduate or advanced degrees and nearly 50% had master's degrees and then the rest had MDs, PhDs, JDs, and MD PhDs. And I was really shocked because I am at an Ivy League university. Yale's considered an Ivy League university. It's not the only university I've been at. I've mostly been at large public universities in America, but almost a third of women in my study had some Ivy League affiliation or degree. They had gone to the Ivy League universities or another quarter had gone to what you would call other elite universities, places like Georgetown, MIT, Stanford, Washington University, um, Berkeley. So this was a very highly educated group of women, I would say an elite group of women who had gone to elite university backgrounds. And so not surprisingly, they were high achieving professional women. Working in a variety of different interesting fields. Um, the majority of women were um, in. Is everything okay? I hear somebody out there. Uh, the majority of women were in some kind of healthcare profession. Many different physicians, uh, people working as pharmaceutical uh, pharmacists, researchers. There are a lot of people in healthcare who are doing egg freezing for themselves. There were lawyers, academics, and because I recruited a lot of women from the Washington DC area, uh, I met many women working in government. Um, some were diplomats, some were in the US Foreign Service, um, some were working in presidential administration, some were lobbyists. 
Um, many were um, deployed overseas um, in humanitarian organizations such as USAID. And I interviewed um, high ranking women military officials, um, US military officers. And then there was the large area of business, women who were entrepreneurs working for major companies such as Google and Facebook, women in IT, especially those working in Silicon Valley, some were engineers, programmers, marketers, and women working in journalism, media, film, the arts. Women were working in a variety of different, very interesting professions. All of them, all of them were professional women. Yet these professional women wanted marriage and motherhood. Many of them said, I've always known I wanted to be a mother and I've really always wanted to be married. Um, and women, you know, only two of them were not heterosexual. Two women identified as bisexual. Most of these women were heterosexual and they wanted to be married mothers. Um, many women explained, you know, I've done my career and my education, but it was not as if I wasn't looking for a partner along the way. It's not as if I was only doing my education and career. I've wanted to be part, uh, be partnered. I've always hoped to find a committed male partner. But these were women, as you'll see, who were left with the question, why me? What happened? I didn't find this male partner along the way. And so I'm going to argue the main finding of my study is that partnership problems are leading women on the path to egg freezing. This is what I discovered, and it's a resounding finding. At the time of egg freezing, 82% of women in my study were without partners. They were partnerless. And why? Well, there were sort of six categories I'm going to just briefly mention. There were more than a third of women who were simply single. They said, I don't have a partner. I don't see a partner on the horizon. I haven't had a partner for several years. There were some women who said, I've mostly been single through my whole adult life. Um, so these were women who were single. And then there were almost a third of women who had been partnered, but had gone through breakups. This included married women who had divorced, women who were engaged and broke off the engagement or had the engagement broken off, and then women who were partnered often for several years, but had broken up often with men who refused to have children. So there was a lot of egg freezing at what I call the end of romance. You know, romance has gone awry, relationships falling apart. So between the single women and the women who are broken up, that was a huge percentage. That was really all more than two thirds of the women in my study. And then I'm gonna say that there's this interesting category of partnerless women who don't, they're single and they're going to be deployed overseas. These were women in the military, women working for the US government overseas, working for businesses that were to, you know, putting them abroad, women who were humanitarians. And so these were women who were single and were gonna be placed overseas for several years and are freezing their eggs before deployment. And then interestingly, there's this interesting category of single mother by choice, SMC. It's a growing category in America where women who don't find themselves with a partner just decide to say, heck, heck with it. You know, I'm gonna go off and be a mom by myself. And they're using donor sperm and they're becoming single mothers with children. And now egg freezing is being used by some women on the path to single motherhood. Women are freezing their eggs and then deciding what to do. And I'm going to, I'm going to say that we're going to see a growing number of women, egg freezing women, who ultimately make this choice to just become mothers on their own. Now, the whole notion that women are explicitly using egg freezing on the path to career planning is just wrong. <laughs> it's wrong. That assumption is wrong. In my study of more than 100 women, only 2% of women were explicitly using egg freezing as a career planning strategy. And one woman that I can tell you, she had just passed the very difficult foreign service entrance exam in the US, and she was being placed overseas. And she said, I'm freezing my eggs now so I can have a career in the foreign service. And then another woman I can you know, tell you was a tech entrepreneur. She was young, she was 30. She said, you know, I wanna be a business entrepreneur. I wanna be a tech entrepreneur and I don't see motherhood working out now while I'm trying to do this. I'm freezing now so that I can start my own business. There were, you know, just a couple women who 
were in that category, but it was not the majority. And those women tend to be, tended to be the youngest women in the study. They were in their early 30s rather than in their late 30s. There were women who were partnered, about 18% were partnered at the time of egg freezing, but they were, half of them were what I would call unstably partnered. Um, and why? They were ready to be mothers, but their partners were not ready to be fathers. The unready male partner problem. So they were sort of holding on, freezing their eggs, hoping that their partner would eventually become ready to be re reproductive with them. And then there were these relationships that, that were brand new, you know, women were newly partnered, or they were in an uncertain relationship with a man who they were just not certain the relationship was, was viable. And then sadly, there were some women who were partnered, even married, and their partner simply refused to have children. They couldn't change their partner's mind to have kids. And then there were a few men who had multiple partners. Uh, women found out that their partners were with other women, or there's this new category in America, which I'll say a bit more about called polyamory, men with multiple partners. And so these were women who were with men, but they were very uncertain about the sort of parameters of their future relationships. And so what's going on here? You know, the main finding, the main finding of this large, it's the, my study is the largest ethnographic study that's ever been done to date of women who've already frozen their eggs. And my main finding is that egg freezing is not being done by career women to postpone their fertility. These are career women, but rather these are career, career women who are attempting to preserve their fertility at the end of their reproductive lifespans because they cannot find stable, committed partners, even though they want them. And so we have to ask if this is the main finding, what is going on in America? Why are there so many high achieving, highly ed educated American professional women without partners? And this is something that I spent a lot of time talking to women about. And here's a typical quote from an American physician who had frozen her eggs. And she said, if I found a man, I'd move to Alaska, but most men don't want relationships. They just want to meet and date. And most women won't go out with the uneducated check stand dude, but men will date an uneducated women, woman. So I think I have about a 0.09% chance of meeting someone. And meanwhile, I was feeling like, OMG, oh my God, my biological clock, it's ticking, it's ticking, it's ticking, it's ticking, you know? So even though I'm a thousand percent happy I did it, egg freezing, it was somewhat like a defeat. I felt like I gave up because I couldn't find a man. So women had what I would call their gender laments and they were sad. They had lamentations about what was going on. And in my book that I'm writing, I'm calling it the men as partners problem. You know, why are women having a, a men as partners problem? And so they sort of identified themselves for major issues. Um, women feel that they have higher expectations for partnership than perhaps their own mothers did. And while their expectation, expectations are higher, they believe that men's commitments to partnership are lower. And sometimes women end up blaming themselves for what's gone wrong in their, reproduct, in their relationship lives. And increasingly women living in large American cities are pointing out that they see the gender demography of their cities as somewhat skewed, where, where there are way more women, educated women, than what seem to be educated men in the urban population. So I'm gonna talk briefly about each one of these. The first one being women's higher expectations for relationships. You know, women said, you know, we were raised by our mothers. Um, and some of them said, you know, my mom was an early feminist. We were raised to want equality, to want gender equality, not only in work, but in our relationships at home. We want equal relationships with men, equal partnerships at home and at work. And so because of that, women are becoming much more selective in choosing mates who are going to be equal to them. And women don't want to settle for less. They say they don't want to settle. They don't ever want to feel that they're partnering somebody out of desperation. They want to be with an equal partner. We could call this the soulmate thesis. They want to be with somebody who truly is an equal soulmate to them. And 
so women, because of this, really don't want to marry down below their educational level or their socioeconomic class level. And in anthropology, you may know this term hypogamy, which is a term meaning marrying down, hypogamy. Women don't want to do this. Educated women want to stay at their educational and class level. And there are some women who said, well, part of the problem is that high achieving women only want to be with slightly higher achieving men. They talked a lot about the alpha males. They were attracted to alpha male men. And by doing this, they really narrow their options even further. And in anthropology, we call this hypergamy, that men, women want to marry up slightly, somebody who's slightly more successful, more educated, maybe slightly older. And for women who are already at the top in terms of educational and career achievement, there may be very few men who are even higher than they are. And so these are some of the problems in terms of women's higher expectations. But women really lamented that men, meanwhile, seem to have lower commitments to partnership and to reproductive partnership in particular. They said, you know, men, we were raised by our feminist mothers to win equality, but men may not have been raised in the same way. Men today don't necessarily want egalitarian partnerships with women. And what we see instead is that men, men continue to marry down or mate downwards. They engage in hypogamy with women who are younger, women who are slightly less educated. For example, you see a lot of male physicians who are uh, marrying nurses who don't have as much education as they do. So there's, there's that issue. And then in America, I heard a lot about this. I had never heard about this until I started interviewing egg freezing women, the so-called Peter Pan problem. Peter Pan, the, 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 the person who never wants to grow up and continues want to want to play. Um, and women said, you know, men now, nowadays, they delay, delay marriage and commitment because they're having fun. <laughs> they never want to grow up. They never want to assume the adult responsibilities of partnering some, with somebody and settling down and having a family. That men's very ideas of what's expected in their lives have shifted, have really shifted. And these can be men who are very successful men. And you know they have resources, but they don't want to settle down. They want to play the field, have fun, go skiing, you know, date a lot of different women. These are not men who intend to settle. And then in addition, <laughs> you see many American men who are the children of divorce. Their parents were really the first generation where divorce became much more common in America. And they may have gone through a kind of traumatic uh, seeing their parents go through a traumatic divorce, and it's made them afraid of the institution of marriage. They're unwilling to trust the basic institution of marriage, and so they're not sure that they ever want to do that themselves. And then there is this new phenomenon in America. Well, it's new, but I call it old wine in new bottles, that men want to have multiple partners. And there's something called polyamory, the idea that people can have multiple committed relationships. You may have a primary commitment to someone, but you also have a secondary commitment to somebody else and maybe a third commitment to somebody else. Um, it's called polyamory, people in polyamorous relationships. And you find it a lot in the more hipster parts of America, uh, cities like the Bay Area, the tech area, Brooklyn and New York City is very hipster. So a lot of women said, well, Polyamory may work well for men, but it's not really good for women. It's causing a lot of problems for women in terms of their reproductive lives. And then there's a sad situation where women who find themselves in the situation of being in their late 30s without a partner, they can't find somebody, they end up engaging in some self-blame, often saying like, I never imagined myself age 37 without a partner. How did I end up this way? It's me, I'm too picky. I let a good one get away. I should have married my college boyfriend. Maybe I'm not attractive enough to men. Maybe I haven't tried hard enough. Maybe I'm not attracted to the right men. And then this one about, I didn't put enough energy into trying to find someone. And I heard a great deal about online dating. Online dating is omnipresent now in America. People are doing it all the time. But women said, you know, it's like a second job to really do it. It takes a lot of work and I already have a busy job and I just, you know, couldn't put enough energy into it. 
And they also argued that not only is it exhausting, but for men, online dating creates a limitless marketplace of opportunities because there are a lot of attractive, well-educated women in the online dating you know, sites and men can just pick and choose. And so you see men doing that and there's a lot of really bad behavior such as ghosting going on. And then finally, this is the one I'm gonna concentrate on, the notion that the demography is skewed, that there's, there are inequalities now emerging in the number of men to the number of women. Women kept telling me that, you know, they lived in places like New York City, Washington, DC, Chicago, San Francisco, but that it seemed like men of similar backgrounds were increasingly hard to find. And women often said, you know, the caliber of women seems to be just higher than the caliber of men in the city in which I'm work, working and living. You know, I have a great group of girlfriends. We're all educated. We're very likable women and none of us have a partner. You know, there's something wrong. If there are six of us and none of us have partners, there's something wrong with the demography. Something is skewed. So they started talking about this with me, the skewed gender landscapes of big cities, where it seemed that there simply were fewer available heterosexual men than women. And I will say that in large cities in America, there are substantial populations of gay men in places like New York City and Washington, DC. And so that has something to do with it as well. But women said it's just hard to find eligible, available, single heterosexual men in the city in which I live. And then women said, and then if you do find one, <laughs> these men are often intimidated. Uh, I heard a lot about the I word intimidation. You know, if you're a successful woman working in government in Washington, D.C., and you own your own town home and you're doing well and you meet a man and he sees you in your nice town home and the car that you drive, he's intimidated. He feels emasculated by your success. And so this sort of skewed notion of inequalities in numbers and sort of in feelings of equality were talked about a lot in my study. And I really, I'm not a demographer, I am an ethnographically oriented anthropologist, but I do wanna talk about some demographic disparities that are real and growing in the United States. I'm gonna argue that demographic disparities underlie these gender laments that women have and it has to do with growing disparities in education in America. There is a gender disparity in American education that is growing, but is, has been little discussed. And women are rising educationally in America, which is terrific for women, while men are losing educational ground, which I'm gonna say is a cause for concern among men. Just a couple of quotes, women are out achieving men in American higher education. And here, the high school, in high schools, girls now account for 60% of high school students with A or A plus averages. They're taking harder classes than boys to, to girls account for 55% of all students taking AP, that means advanced placement or honors level classes in math and science. That's the US College Board. And then there were two MIT researchers named Otter and Wasserman who published a very disturbing report in 2013 called Wayward Sons. And just a quote from that, although a significant minority of males continues to reach the highest echelons of achievement in education and labor markets, the median male is moving in the opposite direction in the United States. This has been carefully analyzed in a really prescient book by uh, an economic journalist named John Berger. This book was published in 2015 and it's called Date Anomics: How Dating Became a Lopsided Numbers Game. And what Berger argues is that there is a significant demographic imbalance in America and actually in more than half of the world's nations. And I'm gonna say a little bit more about that. But to begin with the US, women have been graduating from university in greater numbers than men for years, for years in the United States. And so by 2015, when his book was published, for every four university graduated women in the US, there were only three university graduated men for a four to three ratio. In 2020, and that was last year, there were 27% more women than men in higher education in universities and colleges in America. And this year, <coughs> I'm sorry, there was just a recent report 
that was highly publicized in the Wall Street Journal <clears throat> with recent data from a major educational research group that there has been a 71% decline in college admissions over the past five years. And I mean, there's been a huge decline and 71% of that decline, about 1.5 million fewer Americans are going to college. And 71% of that decline is attributable, attributable to men. Men are not going to college in the numbers that they should. And so by the year 2024, three years from now, female grads are going to outnumber male grads by 38%. And eventually for every two college educated women in America, there will only be one college educated man for a two to one ratio. And guess what? For those of you who are out there and are European, Europe has the same problem. The, this is called the Gender Disparity Index, GDI. You can find it. These statistics are provided by UNESCO to the World Bank, and these are very recent World Bank statistics showing these same disparities of women outperforming men in higher education in Austria. Look at Belgium and the Czech Republic, France and Italy, all above 20%. Netherlands, Poland, 34%, Spain, and the United Kingdom. The United Kingdom is exactly the same as the US. There are 27% more women in higher education in the UK as, and in the US in this in, right now. So many more women going to college, to university. You think of Scandinavia, I think of it as the most progressive part of the world, but the same problem, really actually significant problems in Denmark, Norway and Sweden, but also Finland and Iceland. You've got many more Scandinavian women going to university than men. And Asia, Asia Pacific. I know many of you are in Asia. So look at the statistics, Australia, China, huge country, 18% more women in university. Hong Kong, Indonesia, one of the world's largest Muslim countries. Same with Malaysia. New Zealand, very significant, over 30%. Philippines, Singapore, a country I love. I spent a year at Yale and US College, one of my favorite years. And then Thailand and Vietnam. I mean, these are statistics that are really you know, similar if you look from one continent to another. And so Berger was the first to sort of chart this. And he said, frankly, what we're facing is a man, an educated man deficit and now an oversupply of educated women. He calls it a demographic time bomb for marriage minded heterosexual women in America and in other countries. And he said, what's happening is that these lopsided gender ratios are incentivizing the minority of educated men to play the field and become Peter Pans. They can delay marriage and have fun and date around and not partner, not, not settle, not settle to raise a family with women. And it really leaves high achieving women at the top, the most highly educated women in a very difficult situation because they're not gonna be able to find partners. Similarly, blue collar men at the bottom of the educational hierarchy are also in trouble. They, the marriage and, and family you know, rates are very low among poorly educated men in this country. That's a problem that's been identified for a long time by sociologists. But this new problem of high achieving people having trouble part having trouble partnering is not well recognized. It's not well studied. And I think we really need to pay attention to it because it is fueling the egg freezing phenomenon. Uh, where does this all leave highly educated women? It leaves them with egg freezing. Egg freezing has become highly educated women's stopgap measure to stop the clock while looking for a partner. Um, and women still want a partner. They're hoping for what they call a unicorn, a rare man who is still available, educated, and wants to be a family man. They call these men unicorns. They're looking for unicorns. And so they see egg freezing as a way to prevent kind of a desperation marriage with somebody who was really not right for you and to prevent what they call settling. They don't want to have to settle with somebody who's less educated, you know, not going to meet their standards. And so what I'm arguing is that egg freezing is not about postponing, deferring, or delaying fertility. It's about preserving and trying to extend fertility at the end of the reproductive lifespan rather than somehow intentionally postponing fertility for later in life, 
women who reach egg freezing are usually already in their mid to late thirties. And they're trying at that point to hold on to the remainder of their ovarian reserve by freezing their eggs and putting them in storage. And so I'm gonna argue going back to that thesis of reproductive weighthood, that this is unintended reproductive weighthood. This is women who feel they're really being forced into reproductive weighthood against their will. And what I saw in my study is that although women, you know, were so glad to have this technology, as I'm going to show you, it was still accompanied by a lot of sadness, sometimes by shame and stigma, loneliness, feelings of loneliness. Women were doing this by themselves in IVF clinics, which is IVF clinics are very married spaces where husbands and wives doing IVF are there together. And these single egg freezing women really felt a lot of sadness that they were alone and sometimes regret about their lives and regret that they hadn't found somebody and found themselves in this position. And I'm gonna to argue to all of you um, that there are some similarities we see and there's this great book, it's a very sad book by an, a journalist, an American journalist named Mel Melanie Notkin, a highly educated Jewish American woman who found herself in this position. And she said, you know, I ended up with what she called circumstantial infertility. I never wanted to be infertile. I never wanted to find myself in my 40s with no husband or children, but that's where I ended up. Instead of motherhood, I find myself in a place of otherhood. I'm not a mother, I'm an other, and I am infertile now, but it wasn't by choice. So she wrote this book called Otherhood, and she said, you know, the best that we women can do is to become what she called savvy aunties. We can be the aunts to our nieces and nephews. We can be good to our friends' children. We can find other ways to fulfill and satisfy our motherhood desires, but we still are in this place that she called other, otherhood. And then in China, you know, we've been hearing a lot over the last decade about the situation of leftover women. And there are films about this, there are several books about this, but this one by Roseanne Lake, uh, Lake was one of the first to be published. She said, you know, it's terrific that women are shaping the world's next superpower. There are now all of these highly educated, amazing Chinese women. But, you know, once they get their PhDs and become very successful and high, high achieving, they become intimidating to men. Men are afraid of marrying them and partnering with them because men want to partner down. So this is the same problem as we have in America. I mean, we could call women leftover women. I, American women would not like that name. And we can talk about that. That name, that name leftover women, my understanding is that it was actually a term put out there by a Chinese feminist organization. But you know, women in China, a huge country, millions of women are facing this problem and probably are going to increasingly be, be facing this problem in the future, given the statistics I've presented. So what does egg freezing provide these women who find themselves in this sort of leftover situation? Well, they are glad to have the technology and they had a lot to say about how it made them feel, what it provided to them, at least the feelings that it provided when they did it. And there were 11 different categories of sort of you know, positive sentiment toward egg freezing. Women said it gave them increased choices and options about what to do. It made them feel a little more in control of their reproductive lives. It gave them a feeling that they had some decision-making power. Empowerment, empowering was the word that was volunteered over and over. Women said it made me feel weirdly and wildly empowered, like I was able to do something about this difficult situation I'm facing. Some women said it was their safety net. It was like an insurance policy that they had done, invested in an insurance policy that made them feel safer about their waning uh, fertility. And it prevented regret. Women said, look, I've done everything in my power that I can do. And so I won't look back and have regrets that I didn't at least try egg freezing, trying to extend my reproductive lifespan. It was a huge relief valve. Just psychologically, women talked about the anxiety reduction, the stress relief, that they just felt a world, a weight off their shoulders by doing egg freezing, that it made them feel relieved about trying to find a relationship, that they weren't looking at every potential man as the future baby daddy, you know, that they could go on dates without feeling such a tremendous weight of pressure. And women often said it felt like a little self-investment. I was doing something for me to try to do something for myself. 
It gave women a sense that they might be successful. It gave them feelings of technological optimism, that this was a new technology that they were using, something scientific that was, you know, th there for them now and they were glad to have it. And ultimately that, that it gave them a chance to potentially alter their reproductive timeline, that they could potentially extend their fertile years by having put their frozen eggs in storage. And so as Loretta introduced, I am almost done writing a book that is tentatively called The Mating Gap, Why American Women Are Freezing Their Eggs is under contract at New York University Press. It may come out in 2023. I don't think it'll be out next year, but who knows? And I'm really arguing that American women and women in many other countries now are facing a mating gap, which is the lack of eligible, educated, and equal partners who are committed to marriage and family life. And because women are facing this mating gap, egg freezing is really a costly technological concession to women being in a kind of reproductive weighthood beyond their individual control. And egg freezing is going global now. Egg freezing is found in well over 80 of the world's countries because of the same reason, the studies that have been conducted in places like Turkey, Korea, Australia, the UK, show that it's the same problem. Women lack partners, and so they're turning to egg freezing um, in every country in which egg freezing has been studied. And so oh, here's just a few examples, just some of the countries where egg freezing is allowed. All I, I especially focused on Europe and Asia, but you know, Australia. Belgium, Denmark, India, Italy, Netherlands, Philippines, South Korea, Taiwan, Thailand, Vietnam, egg freezing is moving into many Western countries and into many uh, East Asian countries as well and South Asian countries and Southeast Asian countries. But there are some global bans, countries where egg freezing is not allowed, including in some European countries that are very strict like Austria, Norway, Slovenia, and in parts of Asia, Bangladesh, China, which is the most controversial ban, and, but Malaysia and Singapore as well. Personally, I think these bans are wrongheaded because they are based on the wrong assumption that women might use egg freezing to indefinitely postpone their fertility, you know, put off ever becoming mothers and having children, and so, officials are banning egg freezing because they want women to procreate, you know? So I think it's a very unfair ban, but it's happening. And it's for the wrong reason. As we've seen, women are turning to egg freezing because they want to be mothers. They want to hold on to their fertility and they wish when they're living in countries where there are bans, they wish that those bans were being lifted. And in fact, in China, there are some lawsuits against the Chinese Ministry of Health or government um, by women who wish that they could use egg freezing in their own country, but have been forced to travel outside to other countries in order to do it. And so egg freezing, the future is uncertain. There are many things that we don't know. We don't know ultimately how many frozen eggs it takes. What, what's the number that'll be good enough? In America right now, clinicians are telling women, try to freeze at least 20 eggs. 20 is the golden number. Will women return to use their frozen eggs? So far, this is a new technology, but so far women are not returning in droves to use their frozen eggs, either because they found a partner and got pregnant without using those eggs, or they didn't find a partner and have given up and decided that they don't want to become a single mother by choice. Will frozen eggs lead to future children? Well, in my study, those frozen eggs were already leading to future children for some women, but we ultimately don't know how many children will be born from this technology. That's completely unknown at this time. Egg freezing is beginning to normalize in America. It's a technology that almost every educated woman knows something about, has friends who may have done it. It's becoming as normal, I would say, as IVF is considered normal in this country. Will it normalize in other countries? Um, I think, you know, more research will prove that over time it probably will. And it is definitely globalizing. Um, really, uh, egg freezing is reaching the halfway point and in, in really getting to almost half the world's countries. I think we'll see more and more countries being able to perform egg freezing over time. This is a big question. Are younger women going to freeze their eggs? Women in their 20s, for example. There are some clinics, some for-profit clinics in America that are really uh, pushing that young women, you know, even in college, in university, should freeze their eggs, trying to get them to do this, you know, in part as a money-making venture. 
But so far, the evidence does not suggest that young women are freezing their eggs in droves. And I'm going to argue that women in their 20s really shouldn't be freezing their eggs. It's not a technology for young women. It's really a technology that should be considered. It's costly. It's physically invasive. It's a technology that I myself, if I were in my early 30s, really knew that I wanted to have children, had no partner in sight. In my early 30s, I would start thinking about it. Um, and some clinicians say the real sweet spot for egg freezing is between 32 and sort of maybe up to 37, that period where fertility in women begins to decline, but to do it before the really dramatic decline, which happens at age 37. And so is egg freezing the future of reproduction in America and beyond? Is it really going to be the reproductive revolution that some you know, writers and scholars have argued that it might be? For me, I'm going to say at the present time, probably not. I don't think it's a revolutionary technology, but I do think it's an important new technology for a particular group of women. In the future, maybe but we really don't know and only time is going to tell and so with that i say thank you i'm done and if there are any questions i'd be happy to entertain them thank you so much marcia i dropped down like a list of questions but you actually list them on your i think second or the third last slides um, so yeah. that yeah, so um, I will give the floor some uh, times to gather that thought, but maybe we can start the conversations now. Thank you so much for the talk. It's, it's a topic that I personally am very interested in. And it's amazing to see that it's not just happening in America, but actually as you show that in Europe, exactly the same things happening and also increasingly in Asia as well. So uh, one of the questions I think you've already mentioned is um, will, pe will, will women actually have the opportunity to use those eggs? You know, so you, you've said that you've done the research two intensive years for just following these women. So do you think, um, so, so, and you say that most, mostly not because a lot of them, they either decided they don't want to be a single parent or they've decided that, or they've met someone, you know, and then they they do it without without the egg. And so, in retrospect, what how do these what do these women think? Because I think one thing that you haven't really um, maybe talk about in the slides because before when I read about egg freezing and it's actually quite a painful procedure, isn't it? It's quite unpleasant. Yeah, right. um, I can talk. Oh, I have a whole yeah, chat. So I wonder what those women think about that experience, that painful experience. You have to have like the injection like in order to, you know, and then in the end, you're not using it. Like, so how do they kind of in, in retrospect, what do they think of that? that That's a, a great, great question. Loretta. Say something. Sorry, M Marcia, would you mind switching off the share screen fun function? Oh, okay. So yes, I will stop the share screen. Everybody stop. and build a bit of oh, a look community at that. here. Yes. Oh, that's fantastic. Great. Thank you so much. That's a true Zoom. Yeah, so uh, thank you. So great question, Loretta. Um, I am going to say yes. I mean, going through egg freezing is going through the first half of an IVF cycle. And IVF, as we know, it's a, it's a physically invasive procedure. <clears throat> it involves hormonal injections. Uh, it's pretty intensive. It takes one month of intensive, intensive effort. And when you're a single woman doing egg freezing, the issue is you have to learn how to self-inject, which for a lot of women, a significant percentage of people have a fear of needles. So that was something I heard a lot about. So women have to learn how to self-inject into their stomachs, into the fatty tissue of the, the belly. And there's a huge shot at the end called the trigger shot that goes in the behind. <laughs> and that's very difficult to do. And so there's that part of it. And, you know, with some physical problems, but it's, it's basically the first half of an IVF cycle and IVF has been going on for more than 40 years. And so I'm not going to say it's really any different than all of those millions of people who've gone through IVF. So yes, it's physically invasive. It takes a certain amount of bravery, I'm going to say, to do it. And I, I actually argue that the women in my study showed a lot of bravery to go mm -hmm. through this alone. Um, and it's expensive. And that for women, I mean, I've shown you these women were successful women and they had economic resources. In the beginning of my book, I show that these are high earning women. They were making very high salaries for the most part. 
And so they said, you know, I, I can afford it. I can even afford two or three cycles of it, but they felt bad because they knew other women in their circles or even their sisters who were not high earning and would never be able to afford egg freezing. So the big issues, I think, as you're pointing out, it's costly, it's invasive, it's physically uncomfortable to go through it. And it's logistically complicated when you're a busy working person to try to figure out the timing. You have to have somebody accompany you on the day of the sort of final surgery where they take the eggs out. And so it's complicated. Yes, it is. Having done, you know, having said that, women who had done it, I interviewed women who had done egg freezing, even in the experimental period. So they had done egg freezing a long time ago. And then a lot of so most, most of the women had done it within the last one to two years in my study. And so most hadn't come back for the eggs yet, but even so most people felt relieved and happy that they had done it. You know, most had all of these reasons, as I showed you why they felt this sort of relief and no regret that they had done it, even though it was expensive and physically invasive because it did give them some chance. And the few women who had had children in, you know, from egg freezing in my study, I did not do a, a follow-up study. I did not like go five years later and track the women down. It was just a one, two year period study, but there were some women who did have um, egg uh, babies and some women contacted me on their own afterwards to say that they'd had a frozen egg baby. They called them egg babies, frozen egg babies. Um, and they were delighted that they'd had the babies some did it as single women, which I'm going to say is a growing category in America, and some did find partners. There were some very happy stories of women who did find partners. In fact, more women by the time I interviewed them had found partners than at the time of egg freezing. And for women who froze their eggs with partners, I mean, they froze their eggs and then found a partner or they had a partner. Um, they try first to have a natural baby and they hope that egg freezing is the eggs, the frozen eggs are going to be for the second child. And that's a pattern that I think we're going to begin to see. So I met women who, you know, they found a partner, got pregnant without difficulty, but then when they wanted the second child, they were already in their early forties and they did have difficulty. And so they turned to their frozen eggs. And so, you know, that's a potential use for those frozen eggs. It's just that so far, it's still a relatively new technology, so we don't have a lot of follow up yet on the first cohort of women who've tried it. And so the big studies that have been conducted in Australia and in Europe and the US show that most women have not yet come back for their, from the, for their frozen eggs. And I think in the next five years or so, we're going to see a lot more studies following up on the kind of first generation of women to try egg freezing. So that's what I predict is going to happen. And just out of curiosity, for those women who did find partners in the end, does, did it match up their expectations? Because they've had, do you, do you know? Yeah, yeah, the women who partnered in the end mostly got involved in what I'm calling unequal relationships. In they were not the unicorn men that women were hoping for. They weren't, you know, some of them were not as highly educated. Some of them were significantly younger. Most of them did not have super duper jobs. Um, uh, several, uh, quite a few went, met older men, men in their 40s, even early 50s, who were divorced and already had children, but were open to having more children. So they found divorced men, they found men who had children. So finding a man sort of at the exact same tier, educationally, economically, no. So I'm arguing at the end of my book, American women, because there just is a huge deficit of educated American men, we're talking millions fewer educated American men now, women are gonna have to open their minds and make partnerships with men who are not exactly like them. And, you know, I myself did this. I myself, I'm married more than 30 years. I had my PhD and my MPH. I had two advanced degrees from Berkeley and I married a man who had not yet finished college. He was aged, we were the same, but he had dropped out of college. He did go back and he got his master's degree, but he was a man who was smart and not intimidated, you know? And so it worked out, you know? And so I think that women 
are going to have to reimagine what partnership means. You know, um, that's inevitably going to have to happen. And actually, John Berger, the author of that great book called Datanomics, really argues that that's the case, that women are going to have to start engaging in what he calls mixed collar mating. Highly educated professional women are going to have to find mates who are not in the same professional class as they are. And so I have some very happy stories of this, really very happy stories of this in my book. In fact, the final chapter, the final ethnographic chapter of my book, I, hi, I feature, I start with a very happy story of a woman who was an Ivy League educated lawyer. Um, she hadn't found a partner. She went on a major transnational bicycle tour. And on that tour, which was like a long four month tour, um, she found a firefighter, a firefighter. He did have college education, but not at the level she did. And they fell in love and he moved. He was absolutely ready to commit. She did admit that her major fear was introducing him to all of her Ivy League friends, but she got over it. They loved him. It was wonderful. And she, they went on, they were the, the sort of exemplary case. They went on to have their own baby without having to do anything, a little, a little girl. And then three years later, she wrote back to me, she was already 43. And she said, guess what? We just had an egg baby son. We, we, we needed to use the eggs and we just had our egg baby son. So I think that's going to be the future. That, that relationship type is going to be the future for a lot of educated American women. And I want to say something, be clear. I am so amazed at women's performance around the world. Women are rising globally and it really excites me. It's sort of like what we've been hoping for, you know, gender equality and education and careers for women. And you certainly see that in parts of Asia. I mean, you see that in Singapore where they're just such highly educated women. And, you know, so I think that's a terrific success for women around the world. But now we have this other problem of men sinking, men sinking. It's not just men not keeping up. In America, men are sinking educationally. And so there's finally a recognition that men are giving up hope of going to college, part of its economic problems, but that we do are, we're gonna have this huge, eventual huge gender disparity between educated women and educated men. And that's gonna cause problems for partnership. And I think that's really what I found. That's what I found in this egg freezing study that's at the heart of what's going on with egg freezing that's really interesting because i didn't expect you step into the the male uh, inequality in education so that's that gives me a lot to think about um uh, don't want to dominate the floor and we have another question which is from our set so he or she says that thanks for the excellence talk does egg freezing change women's relationship with their existing partner? Do they see an emergent separation between reproduction and romance? So I guess she's asking some women who are freezing their eggs while in a relationship and how does that change the quality of the relationship or the, the nature of the relationship? Yeah, I'm going to say that um, there were only 9% out of this study of 114 women there were only 9% of women who were at the time of egg freezing in what I would call a stable relationship. And they were in happy, loving, stable relationships with men. And the reason that they did egg freezing together was often because of something aspirational, usually on the part of the man. Sometimes these men were younger than the women. They were younger, you know, uh, for example, a 35 year old woman with a 30 year old man and he wasn't quite ready. He wanted to have children, but he needed to finish law school or something like that. And so they together made the decision to freeze the eggs and then make a plan to have the children later on. And I ha again had some very happy stories of this. There, were, there was a couple at a very prestigious West Coast University. They were both in graduate school. You know, he was younger than she was. And um, so she, she, he said, look it, I'll pay, I'll pay for you to freeze your eggs. And so we can do it later on. And, you know, she went in actually at a reasonable age. She went in at about age 35, which is on the younger side of the sort of egg freezing spectrum. And she learned, unfortunately, that she had something called POA, premature ovarian aging. Her ovarian reserve was not good. 
And they said, look at, you know, in fact, she got very few eggs. It did not work very well. And the physician said, you know, can't you just like try now, start now? And so at any rate, they did. The, it changed his mind. You know, he was like convinced that, oh my God, I had no idea that women's fertility can decline like this. And they ended up having three babies, <laughs> one and then twins. And so there were these couples who were, the men were committed, but they wanted to use egg freezing just to give themselves a little reprieve. But that was only 9% of the couples in my study. <clears throat> so I think it can be useful in a committed relationship when there is some issue of timing or just mostly I'm going to say it was because men were not quite ready to become fathers in those, in those kinds of relationships. Thank you. And the next question is from uh, Huang Hui Yi. Um, she said, thank you very much for the amazing talk. I'm curious that what strategies that you use to gather such reporters to share their, oh, I, I think there's, there's some translation problems there. I think what she meant was that what, what what's your method? How to, because it's quite an intimate topic. How do you get people to open up themselves to you? Yeah, you know, in the United States, we have a very, very serious ethical review process called the mm -hmm. Institutional Review Board and the IRB, you have to go through a process. And so everybody who agreed to the study, it was voluntary. I mean, they were asked um, by clinics that they, I, I made a flyer, I made a flyer, a study flyer, and it was sent out to people who had frozen their eggs. Um, and occasionally it was in the clinics or given, you know, handed to women in clinics but basically women had to volunteer. They had to contact me if they were interested. And then if they were, they had to sign a consent form saying that it would be anonymous, you know, confidential, but that in their names would never be used. Um, but it was, they were agreeing to be interviewed. And, you know, I had an overwhelming response. I mean, you know, women I had, there were weeks I was interviewing a lot of women. Um, you know, there was a lot, I think women really felt the need to talk. Um, so as I said, the way I did interviews, um, sometimes in person, but because there were women in different cities in America, um, before the days of Zoom, I sometimes used Skype. I did some Skype interviews and some telephone interviews, but basically I, you know, talked to women and I always start out with these few basic demographic uh, questions that I showed you their age, where they'd gone to school, you know, their religion and so forth. And then I literally would just say, you know, can you tell me your egg freezing story? And it was like an outpouring. Women really had a lot to say. I, I really didn't have to do a lot of follow-up questioning. These women were articulate. They were funny. A lot of them were funny. They had very interesting stories to tell. And they also had a lot of, I'm going to say sorrow or complaints about just the relationship problem. You know, women said, I just cry in my corner over this problem. This problem has just wrecked my life, you know, for my 30s. And so I heard a lot about gender relations in America. And I'm going to tell you something. This is the first study I've ever done in the United States. I am a, a scholar of the Middle East. I've spent 30 years of my research career working in the contemporary Middle East. And I have a book, my biggest book is called The New Arab Man, Emergent Masculinities, Technologies, and Islam, and, and, and in Islam, or something like that. I'm forgetting the subtitle. But my argument in that book is that gender relations in the Middle East have dramatically changed for the better. Men are changing their notions of what a modern man is supposed to be. So I have this book really arguing that masculinity is changing, men's desires are changing in the Middle East. But a key thing about most Arab men in the Middle East is it is normative. It's considered imperative to marry and become a father. Men don't have questions about marrying, partnering, and having kids. It's something that they want. They're grown up and socialized to want to be dads. So men are very affectionate toward children. They were so affectionate toward my children. They love children, and they see that as part of the joy of living is to be a father. And then I came back to America, literally came back to America. And I started doing this, you know, study with these American women who are just saying, you know, American men are just not interested in anymore. They're not like our father's generation. They don't see themselves as necessarily partnering and being a father. And it was like, wow. And then I heard all these negative things about American men. And so it really caused me to have a little, you know, whoa, what's 
what's going on here? What's going on? And I don't want to blame American men. In fact, in the conclusion to my book that I'm writing right now, it's like, you know, we can't just say men are toxic. There's a lot of discussion in America about toxic masculinity and, you know, men who are involuntarily celibate and, you know, misogynistic and heterosexist. And there's a lot of negative sort of bashing of men. But look, we can't just bash men because I know many wonderful men. You know, it's not just about men, but it is about these changing larger societal patterns are changing. And if we don't recognize men's decline in education and how it's affecting women, we're missing the point. And I, I really want to look at those issues of reproductive weighthood, the mating gap, the education gap, that in the conclusion to my book, I'm reiterating those problems, not trying to say that all men are bad. I mean, that's not the point. Men, men have their own problems and issues that they're dealing with. Thank you. I find the directions like super interesting. I didn't expect that from 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 the time from a talk about egg freezing. Mm -hmm. So I think Gonzalo have a question, and the next one is Jennifer. So Gonzalo first. Thank you, Marcia. I really uh, liked your talk. I mean, it's so rich. Uh, the argument is incredibly clear. Um, and uh, and very precise as well. I mean, the way you're framing it around the, the idea of the mating gap, uh, the lack of illegible, educated, equal partners. But I felt I, 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 I have a question about a certain tension in the way that you're framing the argument and it goes back to what you were saying now about toxic masculinities and unhappiness with men uh, and so on and so forth. Because on the one hand, it seems to me that what you're demographic analysis, social demographic analysis shows is that we're seeing around the world, and in particular in the United States, the rise of uh, highly educated women and the decline of um, the decline of men that are, or at least a sizable proportion of men that are going, that are making it into the educational sector. And this creates some kind of a squeeze yeah. there that allows you to develop your argument and your take on the egg freezing, uh, on egg freezing technologies. But I suppose what I'm, I suppose what I'm thinking about is that, yes, on the one hand, you have the rise of women as an educated, uh, you know, there's some kind of gendered educational revolution. But then on the, on the other hand, we also see evidence coming from studies of household division of labor that are persistent inequalities you know, gender inequalities, uh, stark gender inequalities that surely affect um, quality of partnerships, as well as the perception of what it is to be in a marriage. Um, and also, um, you know, point to a, a certain stubbornness on the part of um, notions of masculinity uh, to, to adapt to, to new realities, including new visions of gender equality in, in partnerships. Um, so I suppose my question is, uh, did you feel in your interviews with these women uh, that this was also an issue and that was part of the sadness and the stories that they were telling about their engagement, their, their technological concession, as you, as you put it so, so nicely? What, what, was this story of a failed gender revolution part of that story as well? Yeah, I mean, that's an excellent, excellent question. And I want to say, I did not interview men. This is not a study of men. Um, and I think that's a crucial gap. I really think that we need to be studying, you know, heterosexual American men, Portuguese men, Chinese men, Singaporean men about their expectations, their feelings about relationships and partnerships. Because I, I you know, to be reproductive, there are two, you have to have gametes from men and women. And so there has to be a sense a partnership in order to reproduce, you know, or or just take gametes by gametes, but you know, where are the men in all of this is a really huge question that somebody needs to take on. But yeah, I think that um, you know, I probably didn't convey it well enough, but but the disappointment um, that gender socialization in America had been unequal. A lot of women, they really credited their moms. A lot of women had very close relationships with their mothers. And if these were women in their 30s and sometimes in their early 40s, their mothers 
were the sort of first generation, they were like second wave feminists in America. They had, their moms had often been sort of raised in the 60s and 70s and their moms were their ardent supporters of like, you go girl, you know, you can be anything that you want to be. And their moms were very supportive of them and told them you can have everything, an education, a family. And so women really credited often their mothers and the mothers were often their main supporters through egg freezing. The mom showed up at the clinic on the days they needed them. So there was that that had gone on, but they often said feminist moms didn't necessarily raise their sons in the same way that they raised their daughters, which is very interesting, right? That, you know, men haven't been socialized to think that they should be equal partners in the household, that they should do, you know, equal amount of child rearing, that women, women and men are ending up with different expectations and um, that this is troubling. And, you know, even like something so basic, I mean, many women said to me, that a lot of men that they they met, you know, they were trying to find pe people to be with, that, you know, men were so intimidated of their material possessions. You know, women, you know, women said, I have a really nice car and it was parked in my driveway. And then we came, the man came over to my house and he took one look at my car and he changed his mind. He turned around, you know, just that he was intimidated by the car she drove. And so like, what's that about? You know, men are their egos are so weak that they can't see being with a woman who can afford a nice car. So we need to try to get at the bottom of that, like what's going on in men's ideas of what they're looking for. And the fact that they still feel that they have to be slightly higher than a woman to be in a relationship with her, that's not working for these women. And so I think, you know, you're at, getting at something but because I didn't, I didn't study men, all I can reflect upon here is what women had to say about them, you know? And in a way I feel like next study, somebody needs to be talking to men in their thirties uh, in particular, thirties and early forties, especially men who've decided to just not partner. And those, the statistics on singleness in America are astounding something like 61% of Americans under the age of 35, you know, between 18 and 35 adult years are not partnered. Like people are just reanalyzing being together, which is very interesting, isn't it? And I'm sure that's happening in other countries too. I mean, if it's happening in the US, probably these partnership issues are happening in other countries, I would imagine as well. So, I probably have to go, go soon, Loretta, but I can take maybe a five minutes more of questions. Yeah, we are actually ending in two minutes. Like, so, okay, uh, maybe the last, I think it's more of a comment from Jennifer. So she's asking about how, like, will the, com the commercialization of surrogacy, which I don't think I, is partly related, but not exactly. Do you have any comments to her, her questions? So she's saying that how to prevent the eggs from being commercialized. Yeah, I mean, again, in American IVF clinics, um, all women have to sign on consent forms at the time of egg freezing about what happened. We, we could call this the disposition of their eggs, what's going to happen to their eggs. And women um, usually say, if I don't use them, um, they're going to be disposed of. They're not sent out. They're not, other people can't buy them. They're not used to donate to other people. You know, there are strict rules about that. I mean, the issue of commercializing frozen eggs, there are now egg donation in the world where young women come to have, you know, give their eggs and are paid for donating their eggs, which is a huge industry. Um, that's a different story than this kind of egg freezing. But, you know, there is a concern about what's going to happen to all of these frozen eggs in IVF clinic laboratories around the world. You know, they're going to be there eventually as egg freezing takes off around the world, there are going to be millions of frozen eggs sitting in storage. And the question is, what's going to happen to all of them? In America, it's so interesting. In all of the IVF clinics, women sign these forms and they have to use them by the time of menopause, which clinics define anywhere between the age of 51 and 55. 51 is considered the average age of menopause. So basically you can leave your eggs in storage for use until 
the early 50s, but if you haven't used them by then, they either have to be thrown away or given to somebody that you designate. They're never sold for commercial purposes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank. We are coming up to um, well, ten thirty my time, but so I think it's eleven thirty or ten thirty your okay. time. But thank you so much for this excellent talk. I wish we we are actually in the same seminar room and we can talk over a glass of wine or something. It's something that I would like to continue the conversations, but um, maybe in the post pandemic times. In the post pandemic. Thank you so yeah. much. This was really um, fun to just talk with all of you. And I appreciate that for many of you, it's like Friday, you spent your Friday night with me. I really appreciate that, including Loretta and Gonzalo. Yeah. And, and maybe, yeah. maybe I really look forward to the book. Thank you. Maybe 2022 will be a better world, we hope. Yeah. yeah. Less of that. Yes. Thank, thank you, you very so much. much. Yeah. Bye, -bye. Bye, bye. Bye bye. Bye everybody.